maker, promise keeper, you finish what you begin, our provision through the desert, you see it through to the end.
Church San Jose Online. We are so glad you have chosen to worship with us today. Uh, God bless you, and uh, we're excited about um, what God's been doing here at the church, and and uh, so thankful that you're a part of that. I want to remind you that we are uh, gathering outdoors on Sunday morning at 9:30. For those of you that are uh, comfortable with. Uh, wearing masks and being six feet apart, being outside in your own lawn chair, uh, out on the lawn here at the church at 930. Uh, we've been having quite a few that have been uh, joining us in their vehicles and finding a safe place to worship with us and join with us at, at that time as well. Uh, so thankful also for all of you who are here online and are, um, are watching and supporting uh, I just want to remind everyone uh, that we are uh, thankful for your generosity, thankful for your faithfulness, but just a reminder that um, it, it is important uh, that you are staying faithful in your giving. And if you um, are, are new to us, and uh, there's no pressure, um, this isn't a spiel, but just a reminder for those of you who are uh, faithfully a part of the church, faithfully a part of our online group, that if you could contribute uh, financially, it, it just it just helps and goes a long way for us uh, during this difficult time as well. And I realize some of you may be going through uh, financial struggles, maybe uh, lost a job or cut back or cut back an hour, so on and so forth. Understood, no pressure, but again, just a reminder you can go online to our church website at sjobc.com, go to the giving portal. You can give either one time or you can set up your gift to be reoccurring. Uh, that's probably the easiest way. Uh, or if you prefer to give uh, uh, more uh, uh, directly the old fashioned way uh, through check or cash, then you can drop that off or mail that in to, to the church. But then again, uh, just thank you for your, your, your faithfulness, thank you for your gift, thank you for your generosity. I um, want to remind you that we are uh, we're continuing to have Bible study online on Thursdays via Zoom, and we are gathering on Saturday afternoons at noon. For those that are not able to gather, we've been gathering online as kind of a fellowship on steroids, just getting together with people 
over, uh, over Zoom and having a chance to converse and talk and share, laugh, uh, uh, share life, and to pray for one another. So we invite you to be a part of that as well. We just finished uh, our, our uh, series um, uh, and uh, our last series, and we're heading into a new one uh, dealing with uh, finding a new normal and uh, the finding new rhythms in, in life. And so um, we just talked about breakthrough, and this is kind of a, uh, of a, of a connecting um, uh, series that, that is just, uh, I think, paramount to bringing about breakthrough in our lives. And so we want to talk about how um, God is setting us up for establishing a new normal in our lives, and we don't want to miss that. We, we don't want to miss what, what God is doing and wants to do in our, in our lives. Um, we're going to be talking over the next four weeks uh, regarding um, what this is going to look like and how we, can, um, how we can be a blessing to someone else's burden and how we can take, the, take our eyes off of our own struggles and our own uh, difficulties and, and how we can be the body of Christ in a, in a world that is, that is definitely struggling and, and hurting. Um, over the course of the last couple of weeks, I've had uh, some great opportunities to meet new people in, in our community and to have some pretty, pretty good conversations regarding um, faith and, and just the, the difficult times, how they're getting through it. And everyone that I've talked to uh, does, did not have a, a faith connection or, or a real faith background. And it was interesting to, to, to just kind of hear them talk about how they're navigating uh, these difficult times. And out of the course of that, I, I had an opportunity to invite them to, to church, uh, talk a little bit about our, our relationship with the Lord. Um, it was just really refreshing to have an opportunity to be able to have a discussion with uh, different ones about where they were at. But let me talk to you, uh, part of the body of Christ, part of the family of God, and uh, what does this look like for you? Uh, I, I want to start with a uh, with kind of a funny little story, and it was a, a, a teacher in her Sunday school class, and she was asking them uh, questions about what does it take to get to heaven? And she asked them this, if I sold my house and I sold my car, had a huge garage sale, and I gave all the money to the church, would I get to heaven? And all of the kids, no, no. And then she said, if I cleaned the church every day, and I mowed the yard, and I kept everything neat and tidy in the church, would I then get into heaven? And the kids go, no, no. And so she asked this question, she said, well then, how would I get into heaven? And Tommy in the back uh, shouted out, you gotta die first, you gotta be dead. And I, I laughed at that because I think, you know, if, if I were to ask a, a, a question along that same line, what, what's gonna come about as a result of all this? And obviously, we, we want to focus on the dynamic that is, that is going to provide the, the most uh, profound or the most uh, direct uh, response to, to life in a spiritual manner. See, problem with problems is they cause a disconnect. And the problem with problems is they cause us to focus more on the physical aspect or the physical dynamic than they do in the spiritual. And when we get so caught up trying to focus on the physical dynamic, we lose sight of the spiritual. And as, as we lose sight of the spiritual, we lose sight of the bigger picture that God wants to bring about in, in our lives. So not necessarily a question of how do I get into heaven? But the question would be, you know, why are we going through this? Why are we, why are we trying to navigate this new normal? 
why are we trying to navigate this, this curveball that seems to be thrown at us from all different aspects, politically, physically, medically, uh, financially, uh, employment-wise, relationally. Um, so many different variables are coming into play as we're trying to figure this out. Well, God is basically saying, hey, people, wake up. Life is different. Life is, life is a, a new normal. And are we going to, are we going to, to uh, allow God to fit into this equation? Or are we going to try to figure it out along the physical realm rather than trying to apply a spiritual dynamic to it? Well, we're going to be talking about the book of Haggai today. And the book of Haggai is, is, a, is a powerful book. I mean, I, I didn't realize, Haggai is one of the shortest uh, uh, of the minor prophets with only two chapters. And the book was written in four sections in those two chapters over a period of about four months. So we're going to break the book down into those four sections rather quickly. We're going to pull out some verses of scripture that uh, are applying to the dynamic of what's bringing about this new normal in, in our lives. Um, in Haggai, they went through what they went through because of their disobedience and because of their breaking of the covenant agreement with God. And we'll go into that in a little bit more detail. We'll, we'll, I'll break that down for you. But their disobedience and the breaking of the covenant agreement with God. So why are we going through this? Let me just throw this out there. All kinds of reasons, all kinds of uh, ideas, all kinds of theories. But let me just say this. We're going through this because I believe we have forsaken our biblical responsibilities to keep God first in our lives as a remnant of believers. Now, I don't believe that this is God's punishment for us as a church or for us as a nation, but I really truly believe that we, we've missed the mark a lot of times when things like this happen, a pandemic or a, a natural disaster or uh, uh, some kind of, a, of an upset in our rhythm of, of the life in which we are, we are living, whether it's on the big picture, whether it's uh, corporately, uh, whether it's personally. I really believe that, that God is trying to get our attention, but we miss the mark sometimes when we fail to realize what that intention could be. We obviously can't go back to business as usual, because things have changed. They've changed really uh, in, in, a, in, a, in a huge way. Um, you know, and as a result of that, our priorities have changed, or they should be changed. And so we need to look at things differently, think through things differently. Um, and then one of the things we don't realize, whether it's directly or indirectly, is that what's really important in our lives rises to the surface. If personal goals and pleasure are important to us, then during this time of pandemic, everything else is going to take us uh, a, a side, uh, side a, a step to what's important to us. And we're going to make sure that that stays important. Our family is important. Uh, our job is important. Uh, whatever responsibilities we have become important. And so the question is, is, is your faith important? What, what value do you place on your, your personal relationship with God? And that's what Haggai is, is uh, talking to the people about. Um, so a little bit of history. Um, the Babylonians have, uh, uh, had, had captured uh, Israel and had put them in captivity. And then the Babylonians were overthrown after a number of years by the, um, by the Persians. And... Um, and during the time of the Babylonians, uh, they had destroyed the temple in Jerusalem, the place of worship for the nation of Israel. The temple was destroyed and laid in ruins. Seventy years later, the Persians have overthrown Babylon, and King Cyrus has allowed um, 50,000 Jews to return to uh, to Jerusalem to begin to rebuild the, the city. And it's during that time 
that uh, some contemporaries, Zechariah and Malachi, were also writing uh, their prophetic books in the Minor Prophets as well. But the book of Ezra also relates and tells the story of the rebuilding of the city of Jerusalem uh, and the, the, the temple uh, that the, the, these 50,000 Jews were uh, entrusted to do. So they began to rebuild the temple and then they got discouraged and their, their rebuilding efforts waned and during this time, they, they lost focus and they began to focus on their own personal homes. Well, Haggai, writing to this, to this need, in the very first section of the four, Haggai is, is bringing an accusation that, that they have misplaced their priorities in this first chapter. And uh, where they were supposed to go back and rebuild the temple and rebuild the city, they, they quit doing that and they began to rebuild their, their own homes. And, uh, and in verse 3 of chapter 1, the word of the Lord came by Haggai the prophet saying, Is it time for you yourselves to dwell in your paneled houses and this temple to lie in ruins? Now therefore, thus says the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. So it was during this difficult time, it was during this, this time of struggle that they had a biblical responsibility to take care of their, their, their temple and their city. And they, they chose to, to rebuild their own homes. And not just a, a basic remodel, they just absolutely went to town lavishly rebuilding their homes in such a luxurious way by, and then allowing the temple to lie in ruins. Now as a pastor, um, I could really use this uh, uh, illustration as a, as a uh, sermon of responsibility that we have to take care of the church and, and that you need to be doing your part to take care of the church, whether it's financially through your gifts and through your offerings, or whether it's personally through your times of sacrifice, your serving, uh, you know, and, and uh, all those things. I, I, I could be really laying a heavy-duty guilt trip in regard to what the, what the church looks like. But that's, that's the surface look of this. But the, the, the deeper dynamic, what, what the prophet Haggai was really focusing in on was this, is that the people became selfish. And during the time of most critical need, they retreated to take care of themselves and did not concern themselves with taking care of anything else. The temple, even though it was a building, had a, had a greater illustration of, of what it represented than just a place of worship for, for these people. The, the temple in Jerusalem was the very central hub of their spiritual lives and their spiritual being. And it was more than just a building, it was who they were. And it was who they were to become. And it, and it represented the presence of God and the glory of God. And, and, they, and they forsook the responsibility of keeping that going. And I just want to challenge you that during this time of pandemic, you know, um, we prioritize what's important. And so where you're spending your time, where you're spending your money, where you're spending your energy, where you're spending your focus right now is determining your priorities. And so in that vein of spiritual mindset that I had talked about and, and uh, opened up with earlier, is your spiritual condition important to you? If you're here watching online, I, you would say most definitely, and I would say I, I agree, otherwise you'd be out doing something else. But the thing is this, is that sometimes we can go through the motions and really miss what God's trying to do and wants to do in our lives. And that's kind of what happens because after Haggai um, uh, causes them to consider their ways, um, the, the people rallied at the end of that first chapter and they just began to, to refocus their efforts on, on building the temple. But the problem is, as we head into chapter 2 and, and the second uh, section of, of the, the four that Haggai kind of broke this chapter into, or the, this book into, 
Um, they, they became, again, uh, apathetic. And they, they really weren't doing the job that, that they had uh, the responsibility to do. They were going through the motions. They were just doing their duty. And they, they really didn't take what they were doing with any significance of importance. And they, they just did what they, they, they just did what they had to do. You ever have somebody at work that all they did was what they were you know, asked to do and never did anything above and beyond that? That's kind of what's going on here. They, they just did the bare minimum. They just did enough to get by. They just did enough to, to be part of the, the, the rebuilding program but it kept dragging on and dragging on and dragging on. And I really believe that in this new normal, God wants us to refocus our energy and our efforts to really doing the best job that we can to, to uh, build ourselves spiritually. So then the, the second uh, section that's found in the second chapter, verses one through nine, and that second chapter is broken into three of the four sections. So verses one to nine, um, uh, Hi guys, addressing something that, that's really important that I think is a dynamic that we all struggle with, and that was shattered expectations. Do you realize that one of the leading causes of divorce is not necessarily financial, it's not sexual, it, it, it's not communication, it, 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 it's not some of the things that we would probably put right up there as being a part of the relationship. The number one cause for marriage uh, ending in divorce is a um, is a, a broken expectation. A husband and a wife come into a marriage and a relationship with certain expectations. When those expectations aren't being met, then, then that leads to a series of all kinds of other problems, and that's what leads to the deterioration of the relationship. That's what deteriorates our relationship with God, or the unmet expectations that we believe that God should be fulfilling in our lives. And this morning, I want to challenge you that, that we need to realize that, um, uh, that there are promises in the Word of God that, that, are, that are what we are to set our expectations on. And in this, that's what, um, that's what uh, Haggai is trying to do. Their morale is low. The discouragement has settled in. And it just seems like this project is just dragging on and on and on. You know, when, when we are, when we experience difficulties in our life, the hurts and the pain, uh, someone said experience is not what happens to you. It is what you do with what happens to you. Don't waste your pain. Use it to help others. That's the focus of what we're going to be dealing with over these next four weeks is how can we take the attention and focus off of ourselves and put it on others? Well, this first part of the this, of this series is dealing with taking care of our spiritual, uh, the, the, the spiritual fortitude of our lives in order that we might be able to help take care of other people. Other people um, will find healing in your wounds. Your greatest life messages and your most effective ministry will come out of your deepest hurts and struggles and pain. So I truly believe that God wants to use this time as an opportunity to grow you into the person that you need to be, not just emotionally, physically, mentally, but spiritually. See, that's, that, that's what's going to make a difference in somebody's eternity, is what God's going to do in your life spiritually. And in, in the setting of the, 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 the Jews in Jerusalem, in the book of Haggai, he reminds them in verses 6 through 9, chapter 2, verses 6 through 9, that there's a promise behind the problem. That there, is, that, that, that there is power that is found in, in, in God's promises. Uh, verse 5, it starts off saying, According to the word that I covenant with you when you came out of Egypt, so my spirit remains among you, do not fear. Then verse 6 says, For the Lord of hosts says, Once more it is a little while, I will shake heaven and earth, the sea and dry land, and I will shake all nations. They shall come to the desire of all nations, and I will fill this temple with glory, says the Lord of hosts. The silver is mine, the gold is mine. The glory of this latter temple shall be greater than the former, says the Lord of hosts. And in this place, I will give peace, says the Lord of hosts. This is a prophetic promise of the coming of the Messiah. 
The Messiah is going to be coming and they need to be ready because the glory of the temple was not found in the, in the, the, uh, uh, the, the gold and, and the silver and everything else they were building around the, the, the temple, but the, but the power of the temple was found in the presence of God. Not in all of the things that were being put into the temple to make it ornate. And, and Haggai was saying to the, to the nation of Israel, the Messiah is coming. We need to be ready because the former temple will be outweighed in glory by the, by the latter temple. And the temple that was in, implying of the Messiah. The promise of what was to come. And then Haggai goes on into this third section and he breaks it down. And, he, and it's a call to faithfulness because the people had become, once again, unfaithful because of the struggle of consistency to stay on track and to stay on task. This whole COVID-19 thing is dragging out. I mean, as pastors, we've been talking and, and we're talking and we're one of the very few churches that, that's really reopened and, and has regathered, so to speak, there's a lot of churches that are still not meeting except online. And what was going to be a few weeks has turned into a few months is now turning into almost the end of the year. Some of these churches are looking at October, November, December before they can even reopen because of the restrictions that are being placed on churches of their size. And what a struggle that they're going through. And so what began as a sprint has now turned into a marathon. And we have got to have the marathon mindset of, of getting through all of this. Even you, you probably thought this thing wouldn't have lasted as long as it's lasted, maybe a couple of weeks, maybe a couple of months. And now it's dragging on and on and on. And there's really no end in sight. We're, we're hoping and waiting for the, the vaccine but even that has been, has been delayed, even though there's promising results and some of the testing that they're doing is still not conclusive and it's still not here and we are still waiting and we are still waiting and we are still waiting. Haggai said, don't be unfaithful. He said in verse 14, so, this, so is this my people and so is this the nation before me, says the Lord. And so is every work of their hands, and what they offer there is unclean. You see, they, they had rallied and were, were doing all the right things, and then over the course of the long haul, they got tired, and they, they became uh, uh, just uh, lost in, in just the, the, the time frame of everything that they were doing. They lacked true repentance, and they lacked sincere devotion to a covenant relationship with God. You see, they, they, they didn't realize that they couldn't hide from God. God saw everything that they were doing, even to the point of the very nature of their hearts. You know, I think sometimes as kids, we think we can hide things from our parents and we realize um, that that's not, that's not true. One time as a, as a kid, um, my, uh, my parents kept matches in the bathroom and a candle because our, our house had five, uh, Five boys and a dad versus my mom and my sister. And so with all the smells coming out of the bathroom, um, my mom thought it was important that we have a candle to light in the bathroom. Well, as a young child, um, I, I, my brothers would tell you I probably wasn't the sharpest tool in the shed. But I was in there and I, was, I, and I got to playing with the matches and, and I probably lit about half of the matchbook and and I was throwing the matches in the, um, in the, in the trash can and the trash can, it was still smoking and smoldering a little bit. And I came out of the bathroom and, and my mom walked into the bathroom and, and she said, who was in here lighting matches? And I'm thinking, how did she know that? Well, one of the things that I, that I don't have among many things that I don't have is a sense of smell. And I didn't realize that the matches had a smell to it that lingered in the air. My mom could smell it and then she could see it. And needless to say, I got in trouble. You see, I thought I had I'd been pretty good about hiding what I was doing, but I didn't realize that she could see very plainly that I was, um, that I was doing something that I shouldn't. 
And, and it's the same way with God, that, that we don't realize that, when, that God can see the very nature of our actions, and he can see past all of that. And so this last section uh, leads into the fourth and last section, which is the, the promise of the future hope of what God has. So I, I just want to uh, bring things, tie things up right here to a close, is that God has a future through all of this. We, we don't see beyond the present because we don't realize that God has a promise of a future. In, um, in verse 23, it says, In that day, the Lord of hosts said, I will take you, Zerubbabel, my servant, the son of Shaptiel, and make you the signet ring, for I have chosen you, says the Lord of hosts. And, and so Zerubbabel was a, was a very prominent figure during that time in the rebuilding of Jerusalem. And God had chosen him and set him apart as an instrumental part of, of what God was, what foundation God was laying for the future. He was the, the heir of Christ. He was the heir of the Messiah. Through his line, which was the line of David, came the messianic line of Christ. And God was setting him apart. And he, he was reminding him that the signet ring is a very important part of the, of the king because that was his ring of authority. And God was giving Zerubbabel the name and the, and the position of authority for the nation of Israel and for the, um, and for the people of, during that time in the rebuilding of their lives spiritually and significantly. And, and the proclamation, this was the, this was the second reference to, um, to the, the Messiah. And so one of the things that I, I think is really significant is that there, there was a future hope for Israel, just like there's a future hope for us. And God is reminding us that there is a, that there is a spiritual dynamic that if we would take the time to, uh, to, to work in and work through, that God will bring about in our lives. Zerubbabel was an important part of, of the rebuilding of Jerusalem. And God is saying to us today that you and I are an important part about the, of the rebuilding of the spiritual condition of our nation today. And it's only going to happen when we focus on the, the spiritual significance of why we're going through what we're going through and how God wants to use that in a bigger way than touching the lives of others. What's our new normal? Our new normal is, is uh, allowing God to use us significantly to change and touch people's lives around us. Many years ago, when we first moved here, um, we were doing a lot of rebuilding on the property. We were rebuilding the temple here, so to speak. Um, we had a group that had ventured down from Oregon that had brought a bunch of adults and young people to help do some work on the church. And uh, it had rained earlier on in the day. And so when uh, we were getting all of our stuff ready, uh, I grabbed one of the young people and a ladder and I went out to the back of the church and I threw it through the ladder up against the, the gutters of the uh, roof of the, of the main part of the sanctuary on the back side. And I put my ladder down. And as I began to climb up that ladder, I got up to the very top of the, the, the edge of the roof. And I stepped from the ladder onto the roof. And I didn't realize that I had my, my ladder angled too, too uh, sharply. And when I, when I put pressure on the, the ladder to step off, the ladder slipped on the wet ground and it grabbed my foot. And I was that, that, uh, that ledge where the, um, where the gutter is, is over 17 foot tall and, and it pulled me off of the roof. And I, I fell to the ground, my legs wrapped up in, into the ladder and I landed on my side. And I can remember very clearly the, just all the air rushing out of my lungs and, and my body hitting the ground and, and laying there, catching my breath and catching my bearings and realizing that, you know, I could be seriously hurt here. 
And as I began to move my body and, and uh, move my legs out from under the, the ladder, I, I twisted the ladder, it was, it was broken. And I, I was feeling around I, and I, I, I got up and I was fine. I was no broken bones, no bruises. I mean, just catching my breath. I had split my eyebrow open and, and ended up having to go into Kaiser and they put eight stitches in there and, and, uh, and afterwards I was fine. And, and once I, once I was able to regain my composure, uh, going to the, to the ER and coming back home again, I went back to work. Now my wife, uh, she took away all ladder privileges from me as a result of that, but I went back to work. And so today I, I, I just want to conclude with this is, is no matter how much we get knocked down, as we talked about last week, we need to get back up and we need to go back to work and we need to, we need to, put as a priority the, the very heart and nature of our, of our spiritual commitment to God above everything else as God is trying to bring about a new normal in our lives, a new rhythm in our lives. Will you do that with me today? Would you pray with me? Father God, we're just so thankful for uh, you and your presence. God, so thankful that as we look at the nation of Israel and the, and the, the temple and how that significance refers and relates to our spiritual condition and our place in this world today, that God, you have set us apart as a temple. You have set us apart as a beacon of light. You have set us apart as a child of God. Father, I pray that you would help us to uh, come to that place where, we're, where we overcome our apathy, overcome our unforgiveness, overcome our, um, our, our sin, and those things, God, that that just keep us from fulfilling our spiritual duty and destiny that you call us to do. Lord, we love you, we praise you, and we give you thanks. In the, in the glorious name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Amen. If you could uh, uh, take a moment and just let us know how we can pray for you. Uh, there's a number at the bottom of the screen. And if you would text to that number the word prayer, and then and then just give us a, a, a quick uh, synopsis of what you would like for us to pray with you about. We would love to, to uh, come alongside of you and pray with you and for you during this difficult time. God bless you. We love you. We appreciate you. Have a good weekend. to do